hi, I'm Ashkel Arvo Space Canyon Wizard. I'm here to tell you today in vlog number five on your martial arts is wrong that your Musashi is wrong. I'd like to talk a little bit today about Japan's premier swordsman, Miyamoto Musashi. That's right, the great progenitor of Nitoru. Get this. Ni is Japanese for two. To is Japanese for sword. Ru is Japanese for style. Two sword style. Is that cool or what? Now you speak Japanese. Don't bother me about it anymore. Anyway. Miyamoto Musashi. Uh, his apocryphal story, because there's very little factual information about him until his very end, uh, begins about 1604 at the Battle of Sekigahara, which was the main dividing point between the Sengoku Jidai and the Tokugawa Shogunate. This is important stuff, and if you read up on the history, you'll find this a fascinating period, if you like, uh, if you like, uh, war. <laughs> the Tokugawa Shogun, of course, ended the, uh, the nationwide warfare that had been going on in Japan for 140 years. The 16th century was a time of great turmoil in Japan and almost constant warfare between what were called the daimyo, the great warlords, most of whom owned entire provinces of their own, either given by the crown or taken by force of arms. So, Musashi lived at the end of this time and it's important for who he is and why his memory has survived so long, where he is placed in time and space. Until 1540, all combat in Japan took place between groups of armed peasantry with spears and noble archers backing them up with a daikyu, with a large heavy bow, or a Chinese bow. They used several kinds, but daikyu is the more common one associated with the Japanese archer, especially the Zen archers. So. These armies were raised by levy whenever you needed one. The local lord would come down and say, all oh, you peasants, grab a spear, or here's a bunch of spears for you peasants, let's go, we're going to war. And could give them an armored hat or a piece of haramaki, you know, a piece of armor of some kind, but you know, you send them out in the field, there they are, big line of peasants with spears, okay, run forward yelling, ah, and that's how samurai combat took place in those days. The generalship wasn't great. Even the people that they claim were great generals were horrible generals by any kind of Western standard. I am not bragging about Western medieval generals either. They were pretty bad too. So this is an era of awful generalship, Renaissance period, I should say. The only good generals in this period, if you consider a general person who gets the job done with the least wastage of resources, no one beats the Italian condottiere. So go home, everybody. And they barely killed anybody. That's how you use the military well. The whole point of possessing force is to learn to be careful and almost hyper-restrictive of its use. Oh, so anyway. Musashi came at the end of the Sengoku Jidai, this era of the country at war. And the problem with it was, at the beginning of it, all the armies had been peasant levies with spears, uh, the yari, short yari in those days, and noble archers. Well, the noble archer not only had the bow, but the bow's a pretty, you know, giant piece of gear, you don't just carry it to a party. So to prove that they were nobles, besides their clothing, at parties and in events, they would carry a pair of swords. It was called the Daisho, the Great, whatever the show is, I don't even know. But they included the Wakazashi, which is a short, chopping sword that was used as the samurai hand axe, used as the working tool of any samurai, screwdriver, hand axe, pry bar, whatever. And then a longer sword, it was called the katana. The katana was a very short sword by uh, Western standards. This would practically equal Western longsword if the guard was here. See that? Wow, it's taking a lot of that blade length but it is giving me the ability to use a second hand. For a person like me, that grants me greater control. For an expert with strength, it would be a waste. But I'm not an expert. 
Hameshkalah. So, Musashi, because he had very strong hands, he developed a sword style that in later years became Nitoru, two sword style. And it was based on carrying a pair of cuffs. Now, for warfare, the samurai used to carry a sword in war before the end of the Sengoku Jinai. They would carry a larger sword than that katana I just showed you. This is called the O katana. It's a fairly large weapon, right? Has a good bit of reach. But this wasn't his samurai weapon for the battlefield by preference. Again, at no time was the sword used as a major weapon of the samurai. The original weapons for the samurai were the bow, the long bow, the daikyu. This told them that you were noble. You stood behind peasants and watched them die while you got the loose arrows into an uncertain future. 1540 came along and uh, the first muskets, smoothbore, harquebus, were um, imported from uh, Portugal. And within 20 years, there were daimyo, samurai lords, engaged in producing thousands of muskets a year. Yeah, it's like that. Don't give them natives no heaters, Kirk. They'll go crazy with them. They sure do. So, what happened was, at the beginning of the Sengoku Jidai, your army was as I described it. A peasant levy with spears and noble archers behind it. And they could all go home to dinner and the peasants had to stay in the line. You know, it's like that. But that inequity was essential to prove the genetic superiority of people who are genetically indistinguishable from the peasants they so cruelly treated. Huh? Whatever. So anyway, I didn't ever listen to myself talk. I do it for, solely for entertainment. So anyway, um, by the end of the Sega Kuchitai, however, after the introduction of the musket, the samurai levy armies, the bushi levy armies that were backed by samurai nobles, had changed and were now a mix of long pikes and muskets, very much like the Swiss halberdiers, who even today guard the Pope. Don't mess with the Swiss, Willis. So these uh, samurai levy armies, you know, with nobles at the back and peasants at the front, created an entire world of armed and weapon savvy people that you didn't want to mess with, right? Well, now it's the end of the Sengoku Jidai. It's all been conquered. The lords have been tamed. Their private armies dispersed. And a lot of the losers became what's called ronin, masterless samurai, because their samurais have been, their lords have been killed, imprisoned, denuded of their lands, forced to commit seppuku. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> oh, it was yesterday's lunch. And uh, that left these samurai without authority to blame for their transgressions. Yeah. So they became ronin. And uh, there were several things you could do if you were a ronin. You could become a bandit. You could get hired by people wanting to be protected from bandits. You could threaten them with bandits if they didn't pay you money to protect them. Uh -huh. And did I say banditry? Because you can be a bandit too. So these are the things that a ronin could do. What he couldn't do was he couldn't be accepted by a legal master because legal masters showed their displeasure for you serving on the wrong side by turning you down unless they needed you. Of course, they need you. They hire you like crazy. They throw you away like a, you know, like a crumpled up condom when they were done. So that was the fate of the noble warrior. If his lawyer had, if his warrior had been killed, I mean, if his lord, sorry, if his lawyer had been killed. So anyway, Musashi showed up right at the end when the samurai armies were composed of a mixture of pikemen and musketeers, much like the Western armies were at that time. So that was a quick catch up. In 40 years, Japan had caught up 300 years of Western civilization technology. It was pretty good. They called it Dutch learning. So, because they called it Portuguese learning and they'd get mad because they didn't like the Portuguese, who tried to Christianize people way too much. And that's a story worth telling. If you want to know who the real Christian martyrs were, if you count the numbers, 
the Japanese and Chinese. By far, we have nothing like it in the Western world. <laughs> you say, well, our martyrs are more important, then you're just a racist. So there you go. I'm talking Christian martyrs, not white or green or purple martyrs. So anyway. Musashi was a masterless uh, samurai. He was a ronin. He couldn't go anywhere. So he started wandering the road, making his money by challenging the chief students, the masters of other schools, which came into being about that time, I'll explain why, to duels. And also fighting for money on the street, because you could do that some places. It was illegal, but the authorities turned the other way as long as the promoter was paying a little vigorous, you know what I mean? A little backsheesh, if you know what that word means. <laughs> yeah. So anyway... the idea of the Ronin became important at this time, and especially in connection with the schools of the sword, of kendo, and various kinds of sword destruction, because the samurai's personal weapon had never, on a battlefield, had never been the sword. Never once was the samurai expected to go out into a battlefield with a sword as his main weapon. The samurai was a noble archer. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Look it up from Nara all the way up to Tokugawa. The samurai was a professional artillerist, and his artillery weapon of choice was the daiku. Now, some of them used Chinese horse bows, Mongolian horse bows, you know, laminates, other laminates and recurves, because the daiku was also a laminated bow, and a double recurve. Beautiful bow. So anyway, probably the most powerful bow in the world at that time wasn't the crossbow. Medieval crossbows were 160 pound pole or more. Yeah. And Daiku is like 50, maybe. So anyway, uh, as the samurai's job became superfluous because warfare had ended under the Tokugawa shogunate, the shogunate decided that the best way to take care of these troublesome samurai, as they were referred to, they were looking for something to do still, right? They've got nothing to do. They're young, they're strong, they're hung, they're dumb, they're drunk. They get a sword, what are they gonna do? Well, so they de-emphasized spear training and musket training, except in the official armies of the shogun or the emperor, of course, but the shogun at this time. So the only people allowed to own weapons of war, in other words, spears, pikes, and muskets, were the federal forces, were the shogun's forces. The other samurai, who were still noblemen, to show that they were still noblemen, were allowed to carry a pair of swords, a short sword called the wakazashi, and a longer sword, which I just showed you, called the kata. The wakazashi was the working tool, like we would carry today a sharp knife or a, or a hand axe. The wakazashi was used like that, and it could be used, carried anywhere, and many people owned them, even non-samurai. But this was the smallest a weapon of war could be considered, and this, was strictly controlled. Only the samurai could thrust one through his belt. So with a pair of swords, the Daisho, he was saying, hey, look, everybody, I'm a noble. I'm a samurai. Look at me. I might be broke. I might be poor. The government may have, like, superannuated my position, but you better pay some attention to me because I'm... I got a Les Paul guitar. You know, that's... I got a world sir. So anyway... As the samurai became less focused on the real weapons of war, the firearms and uh, the uh, spears and pikes, they instead became encouraged to cultivate the sword as an eclectic philosophical achievement. Yeah, that's real. That sounds like bullshit, didn't it? It did. Ah, I like that. But it was true. And so what happened was schools of the sword opened up all across Japan, especially in the capital where all the sharpies and conmen are, but still all over the place. Wherever there was a daimyo, where there was a lord that needed to train a personal unit, right? Because you were still allowed to have some guards. They'd cut that way down since one guy had 500 people marching to Kyoto. They're all armed. And the shogun was like, hey, he's not allowed to do that. <laughs> and they changed the rules. So they made it so you can only have a few people with you at the end. And uh, so the samurai 
without anything else to do. Nobody wants to join the military and be treated like a peasant, honest, because that's what it was like. They became masterless samurai, or they became, you know, owned men by the various uh, merchants who needed guardians, right? Marry you to my daughter, pay you a little money, and you just cut down a couple of yakuza that keep them off my back. You know, that stuff really happened. So, gradually, the samurai as a class were emasculated. The, their purpose was destroyed by the raising of citizen militias, right? That didn't need samurai anymore. And ci wait, citizen officers, commanders were now non-nobles sometimes. Not always. There are a lot of nobles still in the military command positions. That never goes away. You have privileged families. You can't get rid of them because some people are so pea-brained that they think they have to be special in some other way in order to compete with the rest of us. Okay. I'm a wizard, so bleh, I can do it too. So anyway, I'm a pea brain. <laughs> Just read my book. I have, how many do I have now? 13. <laughs> Go ahead and read them. Yeah, I'll thank you for it. So anyway, so these guys, the samurai, all started going to schools to have something to do or else they'd have to get a real job because their stipend that the government had paid them to demobilize was very small. And with each new government, it got a little smaller. So eventually the samurai realized that they were going to be as poor as peasants and might have to get a job. That's not fair. Which is when they started working as protection for the various merchants, because there were a lot of bandits who were other samurai, ronin. And so uh, that created a brisk trade in samurai, back and forth. And there were also unlicensed fights in places where today you'd have like, you know, punch you down the, on the street kind of fights. Well, this was chop each other down with swords kind of fights, and they're betting like crazy. Samurai are big on betting. Japanese in general love gambling. If you don't think I'm serious, um, type this word into your Google search engine. Ready? Pa Ching Ko. P A C H I N K O. And you will be edified, elucidated. Yeah. You'll be so bright, your mom will call you son. So anyway. <clears throat> and they cause a lot of trouble, too. They hang out in the street and, and harass citizens for money and do tricks and really pretty much muscle people around. But that was the Yakuza's job, and that made the Yakuza very mad. And at that time, they started having more influence than the samurai did on the government, at least these masterless ronin and, and the weak samurai that... You know, that weren't as cool as the really super noble ones because even amongst the nobility, they were like poor nobles and rich nobles. You know who the real ones are. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, the samurai started clustering around these sword dojos, the ones that were left. And they, the others would marry into noble families. Like I said, they'd give them a cushy life. they just pull their sword to scare some people. I'll get you. Okay, sir. You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, they became lazy and indolent and uh, out of sorts and basically a, a drain on the economy, which they had always been, really. Professional warriors, if they don't hold to a strict code of ethics that benefits the culture, are parasites. That's all there is to it. No offense. Because your job is not to defend yourself and your job and your privilege. Your job is to defend the people that empower you. That's what that's all about. That's what warriors are supposed to do. Warriors defend. They don't attack. All right, so if you ever studied karate, I bet, he sh bet your sensei at least said that. Did they never start a fight? Didn't he say that? Uh, didn't he say that? Oh, maybe not. Maybe your sensei is a McDojo. <laughs> so anyway, what eventually ended up happening was that guys like Musashi had no way to get a job to use their swords because better healed samurai and better connected samurai got all the good jobs and were teaching all the in all the schools and stuff that they had no way to get away to get noticed to get hired except by killing other guys that were supposed to be swords specialists and so they would go around these ronin that were it was quite a thing for, for a while it was a big deal they would go around to various schools official schools and challenge the boss and beat him sometimes and if they beat the boss it was often a lethal combat. Or they'd just keep clubbing him until they, you know, mewed like a kitten. 
and that would ruin the school, of course, ruin the reputations of many people, destroy confidence in the system, make the daimyo very angry. So the daimyo, it was be, uh, incumbent upon them to get the very best swordsmen they could. And one of those very best swordsmen was Miyamoto Musashi, who had fought several very high-profile duels, which you can look up in, uh, in Google, and you'll find some interesting stories. All of them are apocryphal, none of them are provable, so I'm not going into them here. I'm just telling you the bald uh, facts that I know about the story. His fight with Sasaki Kojiro is apocryphal. There's no record. All those stories about him, his unkemptness and that, all just stories made up by authors. So there's a lot of sludge factor in the Miyamoto Musashi story. But we do have a couple of things from him. One is, he challenged all the local sword masters and beat the crap out of them. That got him noticed. He got hired by a daimyo to teach, and he did that for several years before he got too old to do any more. Then he retired on a pension that the daimyo gave him, or some daimyo gave him. And he wrote his entire sword philosophy in the most impenetrable Buddhist text. It's if a person comes to Buddhism late in life and tries to understand it and then tries to apply it like poetry to his warrior's art, he is going to fail. And so the Book of Five Rings is the most glorious failure of all literature. It really is. In my opinion, read it yourself. I urge you to read it yourself. I urge you to read Funakoshi Shotokan yourself. Don't just accept my word for these things. So. What happened was, he left behind this book, the Book of Five Rings, and in it, in this turgid, flowery, wonderfully impossible to interpret prose, he lays down what he thinks are the tenements of a swordsman's mind, how it should be all the time. In the process of which, he says something that I found extraordinarily memorable, and I'm not the only person. The weapon must fit the space. The weapon must fit the space. That's pretty self-explanatory, right? Which means you don't want to use a longbow in a geisha house. There's no room. There's people milling about and screaming and yelling and grabbing at you. Well, you don't want to use this in a geisha house because there's not enough room for that. There's pillars supporting the skylight in the center of the floor. You don't have room to use this either. It's a, it's a bow staff. It's between five and six feet. And you don't even want to use this. This is the big content, the old content. Imagine trying to swing that in a room full of friends and enemies. See what I mean? You don't want to use that inside. So what we think Musashi was saying was some kind of mystical bullshit, right? Only the mind fits the space every time. That's what I would say. I haven't heard other people say that. But that's my look at it. However, you could also say the Musashi, his Nito Ru, his two sword style, that's what that means literally. Those words are literal translation, which is rare for Japanese. It was meant for two of these, the katana. The standard katana, not the O katana that was carried to the battlefield, but the little one that you carried out with your dai show when you went whoring or drinking or, you know, pushing a citizenry around. Because you weren't allowed to have a big one. Even samurai weren't allowed to have a big one. They were allowed to have this one and the small one. Wakazashi. Unless you were at a school, of course, and they taught the big ones, too. And much of the school work was done with the okata, because it's so beautiful. It's so easy to teach from. It's not in here all the time like real sword play was. So... Miyamoto Musashi had this unique sword style, two sword style, where he would use two katana. And if you think about it, two katana are about right for a room full of milling strangers and friends, right? You'd say, stay out of reach, and you just start, <laughs> start playing the Filipino Cali, you know. Um, and he had tremendously strong hands. That's part of the story, part of the apocryphal story, but very, very likely true. Because when he drew himself, he drew himself with big hands. So anyway... Small swords. <laughs> so, matter of fact, the swords he showed were like teeny little thin things. It looked like ginsu knives, literally. Anyway, and they were the same length. That's what I'm saying. His Nito Ru was too short, Katana, according to his own illustration. 
I'm not making this up, folks. You can look it up. And for him, those two swords fit the space. He wasn't talking about wide spaces or large spaces. And in those, we can say that's because he was a swordsman and professional militaries didn't use swords anymore. They used pikes and muskets. So for large spaces, which he wasn't talking about, you would use pike or musket. You wouldn't use a sword. And if you were in a small space, I'd rather have two small swords than a pike and a musket, because you can't use those in a small space. So for me, that seems to make sense. But it also means that your Musashi is wrong, because everybody thought he was talking about all this highfalutin junk. And he really wasn't. He was a person struggling to master the rhetoric of Buddhism. So he uses some beautiful flowery phrases, inappropriately, with uh, uneven understanding in places. I'm no expert, but what I read seems to indicate to me that he was struggling to find a couple concepts, one of which was that two swords are, are the two swords are the total perfect weapons, because that's what I use, right? So it's confirmation bias, and he was seeking it and found it very well, and was the great proponent of it because he was so good he could carry it. No problem there. But he tried to explain something that is very difficult to explain, which is a mindset. And he couldn't get it across using his Buddhist rhetoric. Other people have tried to get it across. All the great treatises in Japan on swordsmanship try to get the same mental state across. And the whole reason that samurai found Zen Buddhism attractive is because it seems to offer that state. Just do it. Zen teaches, inappropriately, but I have reasons for why I say that, Zen teaches that your reactions are naturally right. Go with them every time. Now Zen Buddhism leaves out a huge chunk of the understanding you need for that to make sense, because that isn't it on face value. Don't take that at face value. What Buddhism means, what Zen Buddhism means is if you were brought up in the Zen Buddhist way, you were brought up training your reflexes to, to react appropriately in a number of situations, and you'll be used to them and will react appropriately, we hope. It's not about just do it. That's advertising campaign bullshit, really. It's about a long period of personal reflection and cultivation until you reach a state, achieve a state of no mind in which you don't need to talk to yourself all the time. Read your Carlos Castaneda. He describes it better than the Buddhists do because he borrowed everybody's ideas to create his uh, yaki Indian magic. But the no mind state is merely the state in which you have made no decisions. That's all it is. And in that state, you could do anything brilliantly or stupidly, and you wouldn't know until afterward, because it is engaged body before engaging brain. That's what Zen Buddhism is all about, is to get rid of the internal dialogue that confuses you in those moments of stress. Pretty simple. And it took 2,000 years for you to meet Eshkelar to explain it simply to me. And people is a bunch of con men, really. But the truth is, you can't have those perfect reactions unless you train them. You're not just naturally a boxer. You're not naturally an archer. You're not naturally a butcher. You have to learn those things as skills to master them until you can produce creative um, departures from doctrine and become within that uh, discipline an artist. I just made sense. <laughs> Pay me. Pay me. I'm worth money, aren't I? No, oh, I feel bad now. I associated success with money. See what a mistake that is. Didn't get any money, now I feel terrible. So anyway, so Musashi was trying to tell people to use two swords like he did. And since he was the best at it, that would be the best of all worlds for him. Literally. Literally. Because wherever he'd get in, run into Samurai, he knew exactly how they were going to fight, and he could beat them. That's his, that's his thing. Uh, so a little bit of con man there. But, you know, if you're a swordsman, use everything you can. Because you're in a world that doesn't honor swordsmen anymore. So it's all in these tight little groups. 
at the dojos. People on the street weren't talking swords. People on the street were talking the armies, the invasions, right? 1903, Tsushima, yes, and Tojo, or Togo is now the new star of the Japanese historical militarism. Yeah, he defeated an entire fleet. What did you do, Miyamoto Masashi? Kill 150 men? Ha <laughs> ha! Togo killed 3,000! And then he came home to get rearmed so he go out and did some more. So that's the problem. We have our Miyamoto Musashi wrong. He wasn't the excellent warrior that we claim him to be. He wasn't the perfect warrior that could rave his way across a standard Japanese battlefield because a standard Japanese battlefield never honored the swordsman. He'd be ordered to combat to any archer or spearman. Doesn't matter how good you are in the movies. Physics matters in the real world. Talk to a line of spearmen versus lone swordsmen. See what happens. See what the spearmen tell you. Because the swordsman's not going to be there to tell you the story. Yeah. And get this. I'll explain why the spear took over. Why the sword was never an important part of the samurai armoire. Only a part of his ID card. You ready? This is why. You want to fight an enemy. Right? You want to fight an enemy. And so you have to mass a bunch of peasants together. Because you can't get that many nobles together. This is a true story. You're going to mass all these peasants together and mass arm them with a weapon that can be used simply and easily and that they can use to kill somebody else at a minimum of training. Well, that sure as hell ain't the sword. The sword requires mastery to be good at it. And even more, you can't use a sword in a straight line like this and expect it to work. That's what you do with a spear or a battle axe or a pike. You want to have a bunch of peasants together and give them all one. Then it becomes dangerous just to come up to them. And the sword is no good against that. No good against the traditional forms of combat arts that they used in Japan during the time the sword was supposedly king. It was never king. It's just a badge of honor for the nobles so that they can get a little extra something something. So your Musashi was wrong. And his sword style wasn't meant for the battlefield. It was meant for a world in which you only existed inside of dojos and whorehouses and no poetry places. Thought you find that interesting. If you didn't, well, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, please write any complaints or uh, corrections on the back of a $100 bill and send them to this address.